Good evening, everyone. Hi, good evening. Welcome to the historic New Orleans collection. My name is Amanda McFillin. I'm the Associate Director of Museum Programs, and we're delighted to have you all here with us this evening for this program, The Tunica Biloxi and the Rise of Louisiana. Um, this program is part of our founding era exhibition programming, and I hope all of y'all have had a chance to go through the exhibition. How many of y'all have seen founding era? Okay, lots of hands. Thank y'all. I'm really glad. And if you haven't seen it yet, we encourage you to go see it. It's up through May 27th, so you have a little over a month left to go see it. Um, we have two other events related to founding era that are coming up that I'd like to tell you about. Uh, on May 12th, it's a Saturday, May 12th, from 1 to 4, we're going to have Dr. Eddie Boyd, who uh, was with the University of Michigan School of Pharmacology, and he studied African American herbal remedies. Um, and he is going to be here in the counting house, and he's going to be doing kind of an open house demonstration. He actually works at Destrahan quite a bit, and he uh, is. Um, kind enough to come bring his presentation from Destrahan over to the collection. He's going to have his herbal remedies with him and he'll be here in the Cunning House and you'll be able to come anytime between one and four and talk to him about his knowledge about herbal remedies. So that should be really fun. Um, and then on May 22nd, which is a Tuesday night, over in our research center at 410 Charter Street, we have Dr. Dennis Reinhardt, who's going to be talking about early French mapping in Louisiana. So we'll have the exhibition here open from five to six extended hours so you can see it. And then if you want to go hear him over at the research center talking about early French mapping and some of the maps you'll see in the exhibition, you can do that. So we hope you'll join us for both of those. Um, these programs have been really popular lately. And so we really strongly recommend if you're interested in one of them, you don't have to sign up for the herbal remedies demonstration because that's kind of a come and go presentation, but the French mapping, if you're interested in coming to that presentation, please call or go to our website and send us an email to make a reservation because they um, very well might fill up and we want everybody to get a seat. Um, so the way this is going to work tonight, we have John Barbary here with us and uh, I'm going to introduce him real quick. He's going to come up and talk in the pod at the podium for a little bit and then he and I are actually going to be in conversation tonight. So we're going to be sitting at the table and uh, having a conversation um, talking about the Tunica Biloxi and then afterwards we'll be happy to take questions and answers from the audience. So I will go ahead and introduce him right now. Let's see. John Barbary is Director of Development and Programming for the Tunica Biloxi Language and Cultural Revitalization Program. Let's see. Prior to joining the LCRP staff, Barbary worked for 20 years in marketing and business development for the tribe. He holds a Master's in History from the University of New Orleans with an emphasis on archives management. He has held positions at the Historic New Orleans Collection. Goodwin and Associates, where he helped catalog the Tunica treasure prior to re repatriation, and the National Museum of the American Indian at the Smithsonian Institute, where he was the first, uh, first appointed Native American archivist. Barbary has chaired the Tunica Biloxi Powwow Committee since 1995. So please join me in welcoming John Barbary. Lati Lapu, Ima Jan Barbre Tisa, Ima Yoronik Hilaik. Good evening, my name is John Barbary and I'm Tunica Biloxi. Uh, before we sit down and start having our discussion, I wanted to share a, a brief passage from um, Wild Frenchmen and Frenchified Indians. Uh, a lot of you might be familiar with this by Sophie White. There's a, a little passage that I think kind of is our, sort of a metaphor for, the, for tonight. Uh, there remained lingering references to the potential for Frenchification in the 18th century and the occasional allusion to, the beyond, to this beyond the Illinois country. For example, in the description of Tunica chief Kahura Ujoligo as baptized and almost Frenchified, but through but th though he was observed as um, dressing in the French, uh, French manner and, uh, let's see, French manner, owning a complete suit of French clothes, 
At least one chronicler described him as preferring to carry his breeches rather than wear them. <laughs> so. Thank you. That was um, really it's a funny passage, but I also think we were talking earlier that that's a very um, kind of telling metaphor for you know um, the tunica's relations here in Louisiana and um, having to be amongst different European uh, groups of settlers that were here and kind of having to be very diplomatic in their interactions with them. Uh, so we, uh, the founding era focuses on the 18th century here in Louisiana and the founding decades of the city and I was wondering if you could take us back to the 18th century and the Tunica and the Biloxi people and uh, tell us what their world was like at that time. Okay. Well, uh, I have to say that a lot of a lot of what I'm going to be talking about tonight are things that have been researched and uh, you know and written about. And uh, our tribe just put out a book that has a series of articles that are talking about our history and and our culture and so forth. And uh, so a lot of the world tradition that where we would have learned this as a community has sort of faded. And so. Uh, uh, part of what I do is try is trying to bring it back to our community. So, uh, um, but getting back to uh, uh, the, basically uh, the, uh, the Biloxi, uh, the Tunica and Biloxi, Biloxi tribe is really an amalgamation of the tribes. And uh, the, the Biloxi people in the 18th century, mm -hmm. actually before that, lived on the Gulf Coast. Um, when uh, Iberville got here, he uh, create, uh, had a, built a fort at Biloxi, and it was right next to the Biloxi village. Uh, uh, the Tunica lived up river. Um, uh, we we encountered DeSoto back in uh, 1541, um, and then the French in about 1699. Uh, it was uh, there, uh, or with the Tunica moved down river. There's more information about the history of the Tunica, but uh, the, when they encountered DeSoto, they lived at the confluence of the Arkansas and Mississippi. Uh, one, uh, and then when the French, they encountered the French, this was uh, more around the, the Yazoo and River, uh, Mississippi uh, confluence. But this whole thing has to do with our people's uh, adeptness in the trade of the period. You know, we, uh, we were heavy into the salt trade and also later into horses. Um, and when the uh, French came, uh, we saw that there was an opportunity there. Uh, the uh, French came down river and they uh, actually opened a mission uh, at our village at, uh, at that point in 16, actually it was 1700. And uh, we had a priest who was there, a priest by the name of Davion. And uh, while he wasn't always that successful in uh, converting uh, uh, our people, we saw that by having him there, it opened up a whole, I would, shall I say, a market for us. And we saw that uh, it was important to, uh, to welcome the French um, and to, to get to know them and, and, and to trade with them. Um, leading into the uh, 18th century, there was, uh, our, uh, there was a lot of uh, the smaller tribes. Uh, from the time of the Soto, when we were uh, great numbers in our community, Things change. Uh, all the, the things that uh, DeSoto brought to us, you know, we, we like to eat pork. That's a good thing. That's, that's something that lasted. But also, he brought disease. And so it decimated the, pop the native populations all up and down the river. Uh, and uh, so by the time the French got to us, we were somewhat smaller. We still had some military, uh, we were a military asset for the French, but we also were a diplomatic asset as well as a trade partner. Uh, salt was very well sought after um, by the colonials, and uh, so uh, it was something that we, we provided for them. Um, there's a um, Frenchman by the name of Saint Denis who actually went to Natchitoches with some uh, tunical warriors, and they actually built a trading post there, which was uh, Fort mm -hmm. Jean, Saint Jean de Baptiste. And, uh, so, uh, so we were all part of that trade route with the Caddo's 
into Texas, or what is now in Texas, into Mexico. Uh, the French legally could not trade with the Spanish, so there was a lot, there was this illicit trade going on between the French and the, the native populations and the, uh, and the Caddo and, and down into, um, into Mexico. So, uh, so of course, it's for cheaper to come that way than to ship them across the ocean. So, uh, but uh, the, uh, the atmosphere in that time, you know, the French, when they first got here, they were struggling. You know, they, they didn't really get a lot of support from overseas, uh, and they depended on the native people. Um, uh, because a lot of these tribes that had suffered from all this disease and were smaller groups, uh, they, they were preyed upon by the large tribes, like the Creeks, the uh, Chickasaw, Choctaw. Um, and so they sort of lived together. Uh, the Ofo, who were part of the remnants of the Ofo that were with our community um, uh, into the early 20th century, uh, we lived together, and it was a matter of protection, you know, uh, we had to, uh, uh, and we, so there were all these, um, you know, alliances that were among the, uh, what they, uh, there's a, a, a historian by the name of Elizabeth Ellis who uh, call, uh, used a term that was, I guess, was coined uh, the petite nations. Uh, and uh, uh, so these small nations really had a lot of power and because they, you know, they had these alliances uh, and, and they were able to make sure that the trade occurred, that people could go up and down the river, and so, uh, so it was something that helped the, the early French colonies to, to really to, um, to, to take hold. If without the help of the indigenous people, they would have, they would have faded away. Mm -hmm. Um, I forget, I was reading in the book, and there was a part, I think it was the British were trying to go up the Mississippi River, and the Tunica had actually blocked the river <laughs> and um, managed to turn them back. And then I think there was had to be some kind of diplomatic relations between the Tunica and the British at that time to kind of establish that they were able to pass up the river yeah. before that could happen. Do you, can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh uh, prior to the 1764, when Spain took over uh, Louisiana, and uh, the British had had partnerships with the Chickasaw, and so the Chickasaw were they were heavy into the slave trade, and they would prey, like I said, they would prey on the smaller tribes, and so we moved down the river away from that. But uh, when the, the British got, you know, East Florida and uh, uh, and Spain got Louisiana. Uh, they thought they only had to deal with the larger tribes. They didn't understand the importance of these smaller tribes had uh, because there were alliances. There were uh, even the Natchez, who uh, Tunica people had kinship and political ties with the Natchez. But later on, the French sort of stepped back away from supporting uh, the Natchez, and uh, then they started this war. Well, even though that we had these ties, the Tunica had ties with uh, the Natchez, we had to choose sides. And, um, and um, you know, we knew where our bread was buttered. So, uh, uh, so there were some bloody battles there. It was like in the late 1720s. And, uh, um, but the British, like I said, they did not, they didn't really understand that they needed to create these alliances with the smaller tribes. And so, there, I think it was long the year of six, 18, I mean, 1760s, and sometime in the 1760s, there's this flotilla of, of British people that are coming up the river. There's like 400 of them. And then there's a small group of Tunica, of Oil, Ofo, and some Choctaw, about 50 of them. And they attack, they start, as the, that flotilla comes up, they attack them shooting them, and sort of the British had no idea how many were attacking them. They all they knew they were in the middle of it. They were being shot at from both sides. So they turned around and they went back to New Orleans, 200 miles down the river. And um, there's, uh, so from that time, the British realized that they needed to um, deal with this, these smaller tribes, and there's a lot of, uh, 
uh, gift giving going on, you know, uh, uh, whenever we, delegations of our people would come and visit the forts or whatever, they would, uh, we would expect to be feted and to be uh, gifted. And, uh, and uh, there's, uh, you know, several um, uh, situations where uh, the, like the uh, Spanish governor, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who's complaining about how much the tunicas are getting, you know, they're getting like twice as much as, as the other tribes, that, you know, and, uh, um, and uh, so, uh, and then when Arabi came, he saw the wisdom of making sure these tribes stayed happy, and, and, uh, and because uh, they, they, they wanted access to the trade on the river, and the Tunicas controlled that, even, even though we were very small. Um, about by that time, I want to back up a little bit. There's a story that I wanted to mention that mm -hmm. was prior to that period when the Spanish came in, the British came into the scene. Um, you know, I talked about the Natchez, and um, you know, and you know, like I said, we, we chose sides and we fought against them, and uh, they were bitter about that. There's a story, and um, I think it took place around 1731, where a delegation of Natchez come to a Tunica village, and they want to come in, and they they're asking the Tunica to talk to the to the uh, the colonial governor and to you know ask if they could have peace you know and but uh, I think they came into the village and we we fed them we, you know we uh, danced and we sang and and it was time to go to bed they turned on us and massacred a good part of the village um, there's a picture I think in the Bath's picture mm -hmm. uh, it uh, shows a chief uh, uh, one of our war chiefs who survived, and he's with the widow of the chief Kavur Joligo, the guy who dressed in, dressed in the French style. He was killed in, in that, that battle, and uh, so uh, later, uh, so uh, it was after that time. You know, we we regained control of the situation, and Natchez, you know, were basically on their way out, uh, and uh, we moved downriver, um, closer to. That was just north of the um, Red River kind of confluence, but we're moved sort of further south. And it was at that place where the burials um, that we'll talk about later, I'm going to talk about the Tunica treasure, which is in our museum, and that's the period from when uh, those uh, grave goods are, are collected. So. Yeah. And that was um, that was up near Point Capi, right? Yes, just yeah. north of Point Capi, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in the 18th century, speaking of the 18th century, is it true that the Tunica were involved in the American Revolution? Yes, of course, you know, we had great relationships with the Spanish government. They, they took care of us, we took care of them. Um, and um, you know, Galvez, the, the governor here, um, uh, he was already plotting against the British, uh, you know, uh, and uh, whenever um, Spain declared war on Britain, um, uh, he uh, organized a, a very multi-racial uh, band of soldiers, and about 150 of them were uh, indigenous. And there were Tunica and Ofo, uh, my people, who were in that, that army that fought against uh, the British uh, at Manshack, uh, Fort Dubuse, I believe, and uh, Fort Dubuse, and and also at Baton Rouge. Uh, the fort at uh, Manshack was basically dilapidated, and they quickly built a, a fort north of there at Baton Rouge. And so, uh, of course, that first fort fell real quickly, and then they went up to Baton Rouge, and it didn't really take that long then to take that place. And of course, I think some of them followed. Galvez when he went to Florida, Pensacola, and so forth. So, uh, but um, I can say that I'm a son of the American Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, I find it just so fascinating that it's a very small, the Tunica were a small nation here and are just connected to everyone and are just moving around and forming alliances and um, economic trade, you know, trading with everyone there. Um, I guess, if, is there any more that we need to say about the 18th century? Okay. Well, uh, like I may have mentioned earlier, that in the first part of the 18th century, 
we had more of a military uh, asset for the colonials, uh, uh, diplomatic as well, and trade. But when we got past the Natchez Wars, we were less important as far as uh, being a military force. Even though we did have some uh, orders who fought uh, against the British, but uh, we were less of a, an issue there. But, but still a diplomatic um, asset for the colonial powers. And so, uh, and so, so you have all these alliances going on. It was very complicated. Uh, you know, uh, uh, those who were our friends at first maybe were not our friends later. But those who were not our friends were our uh, became our friends and. We we knew that uh, we played we played the British we played the, the Spanish we would uh, uh, there's stories of uh, uh, some of the chiefs when they go to visit uh, the Spanish they would be wearing the British medals and then when they go visit the British they were wearing the Spanish medals <laughs> and you know and then uh, you know the, those and they, those governments they they were into these boundaries of course you know east side of the river British west side of the river uh, Spanish and so uh, Tunicas were really one of the few tribes that actually lived on both sides and we would move back and forth just to get under their skin you know, so and, and but we realized that we control we wanted to control the situation we didn't uh, you know we were a small tribe but we had that we understood the, the diplomatic power that we had and uh, so it was yeah, you know, yeah. Um. So moving forward, I guess, into the 19th century, how did things change for the Tunica once y'all, once Louisiana became part of the United States? Um, after uh, battles in 1779 with uh, Galvez, uh, uh, tribes, uh, the Biloxi, were already living near us at Point Coupe, and um, uh, the Spanish had uh, set aside some land uh, where we are now in the Royals Prairie. Um, going up the Red River a little bit, so uh, um, and so uh, over after years after 1779, we started migrating uh, into that area. Um, uh, at first, the uh, Biloxi and the Tunica lived right next to each other on Coulee de Gris, uh, Coulee of the, of the Crane, and uh, there was some. Disputes that went, but there was a lot of intermarriage at that time. And um, even though we were, we spoke different languages. We, you know, a lot of people spoke Mobilian and you know the trade language, and and then they started to speak French. And uh, so, uh, um, so we started moving into that area. A lot of the Biloxi um, kind of broke off and uh, create uh, started villages of its Choctaw people. So there are Choct I have Choctaw relatives too. So. Uh, so uh, we were less, you know, and then that, that's basically the, uh, around the time when, the, you know, the American period, you know, the Louisiana Purchase and then into the early 19th century. And, uh, you know, we, uh, the, a lot of the colonials that lived in that area, uh, you know, they would they claim land, you know, land that was really our land that had been set aside by the Spanish, you know, and uh, but the, the Americans did not recognize that. So there was a lot of land claims going on. There is a, uh, a, a sad story to place in the early uh, 19th century where there's uh, there's a Frenchman who is uh, uh, every year he he moves his fence and he moves it into where the Tunica land is. So one of our chiefs uh, at the time uh, got fed up with that. So there was him and some of the other uh, Tunica Biloxi men at the time. They went and they started pulling up the fence posts. And the Frenchman comes up and shoots, shoots him in the head. And, you know, we were a small community. So we just kind of, for a while, we were just kind of underground. And uh, the, the heir uh, who the young man, young man who was going to be the chief, they, uh, he was put into hiding for a long time. Um, and uh, um, 
there's other uh, things that went on in the 19th century. A lot of it's documented through dealing with land. Uh, um, there was a t uh, tuna Biloxi had a village near Woodworth, and uh, by that time, Tuna and Biloxi they had intermarried, and we really were one community. But we had other villages, and so uh, we. Uh, came on the hard times in the early part of the 20th century and that land was sold. And so they, a lot of the Biloxi people moved back to Marksville. And so, uh, so, uh, so we were small indigenous community, uh, just struggling to stay alive. And uh, through that period, you know, uh, with the influences of the French and so forth, a, a lot of our traditional culture and language faded away. Uh, um, we like to say, uh, we like to say it went to slumber, but it was always there. Uh, but uh, it was uh, not being used. And you know, we had to live among the, the Caucasian, the colonials, the French, uh, and speak their language. And we still had connections with other small, small regional tribes. Um, and uh, we were the Indian people who had land in a Walsh parish. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll talk about this in a little bit when we talk about the revitalization of the Tunica language, but uh, when, uh, when did the last um, Tunica, native Tunica speaker, pass away? What era was that? Um, well, there was uh, three ling linguists, uh, anthropologists, who uh, had visited the Tunica of Biloxi. Um, there was a guy named Gachet in the 1880s. Uh, he was from the Bureau of Ethnology. He was a Swiss guy and spoke French, and so he was able to communicate very well with everyone there. Uh, um, there's uh, pictures that were running earlier. There was a guy who was one of his informants, went by the last name Johnson. Um, uh, and then in, in around 1911, uh, there was John Swanton, who was a well known anthropologist who came in and did a study of the Tunica language. But uh, a lot of work was done by a linguist by the name of Mary Haas. And, uh, you know, uh, she worked with, uh, was with my great grandfather's half brother. Uh, his name was Sosostri Mushigan. And uh, uh, spent a lot of time with him. Uh, in fact, there's a story, I mentioned this to a few people earlier. Uh, uh, she was uh, working on her PhD, uh, or on her dissertation, and um, she came down and she knew a guy, uh, a guy named Swadesh who was down there with the Chittimacha. He was working on their language, and so she actually took Sosostri and took him away from the village and went down to St. Mary Parish. And uh, eventually, I understand that uh, Swadesh and Mary Haas got married. So, uh, um, I'm told by some of my elders that, um, that some of the vocabulary that was, uh, she recorded had a lot of, uh, I don't know, romantic uh, <laughs> type themes, you know, and, uh, it's, which is a joke. Actually, Pete Gregory told me that, so uh -huh. that's Northwestern. So, but um, anyways, so those are the three linguists that, uh, that uh, actually a lot of the work that we're doing now is based on their work. Uh, we were fortunate to develop a relationship with Tulane University back in 2010. Um, and so we're really kind of bringing a lot of this research, uh, modernizing it and making it more accessible for our community. Uh, where, uh, so, uh, Mary Haas had developed a dictionary, a, uh, a grammar, and also uh, a book of text, which was utterances, stories. Uh, it was uh, little small bits of information about our culture, traditional culture. And so this, a lot of this is all we have, the only links that we have, because like I was saying earlier, a lot of the oral tradition was interrupted. And so we're trying to bring these things back into the minds of our community now and, and um, shine a light on it, but also to teach the Tunica language. Well, I want to talk to you more about the Tunica language in a little bit, but we'll back up a little bit 
uh, now we're in the 20th century, and tell us about um, the Tunica Biloxi and the circumstances that led to your federal recognition. Okay. Well, um, from the time of Mary House, back in the 30s, uh, 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 an early part of the 20th century, there were some chiefs that uh, they knew our situation. We were very poor. Um, uh, and I mean, we had to, had some farming and fishing going on, but uh, um, very poor. And so it was around that time that we got, uh, we, some of our leaders uh, like uh, um, um, uh, Eli Barbary, who was my great-grandfather, and uh, uh, Sisso Sri, and uh, a little bit older generation, Volsanchiki, and they, you know, they, they were trying, keeping the culture alive, but they also realized that we needed to get some kind of help from the government. So uh, my, uh, my grandfather and his father, Eli, and uh, my uh, grandmother's, uh, my great, other grand -grand great grandfather, Horace Drew Reed and uh, uh, Clarence Jackson, they went, they got in a Model T Ford and drove to Washington, D.C. The community pulled their money together and they sent them up there and, and uh, they went to the Bureau of uh, Indian Affairs and uh, you know, there, uh, there was sort of a, um, you know, uh, uh, they, they spoke with them, but they, there was little knowledge of the Tunica Biloxi. We were such a small community that the only official federal information they had was some early uh, eight, 19th century report by a guy named Sibley. And, you know, he basically kind of wrote us off as just being a remnant group that would probably just fade away, but we were still here. And so uh, um, after that trip, uh, they sent down a, a, a woman who um, did sort of an assessment of the community. Um, Underhill was her name. And uh, she, uh, she spoke to a lot of uh, tribal members. And there, by that time, there, uh, my grandfather's generation, they, a lot of them had already moved to Texas, southeast Texas. Uh, the lumber mill and Woodworth had closed, and so a lot of them worked in that industry, and so they followed the, followed the lumber mills to uh, Southeast Texas. And so, really, the, her recommendation was that the rest of us should move to Texas. But you have to think about it. Uh, all we had was our land, and we identify ourselves so much by where we're from and where we live. And there were, uh, you know, there was sort of a split in, among the tribe. Uh, my grandmother's family, the Pareed side, was in favor of staying put. But the Barbary side, my grandfather, they, he thought that we should sell the land and move to Texas. But it, they held firm, they stayed there. And uh, over time, um, uh, fast forward to the 70s when uh, the, the federal government had, uh, had created this process to uh, recognize uh, federal tribes, recognize tribes, acknowledge them. Um, I believe it was 78, yeah. And uh, so we uh, had uh, my, one of my cousins, uh, Chief Joseph Perrine, uh had developed a uh, relationship with, um, I knew I was gonna forget his name, uh, famous um, Native American uh, a legal scholar. Um, oh, gee. Anyways, uh, they did an interview on ABC television and brought, uh, he brought, shined a light on Tunica Biloxi as being an example of a tribe that fit well into this, you know, as a candidate for this acknowledgement. Um, and um, so, we just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and uh, they supported the research that was needed to pre, uh, for the petition. Um, it was submitted in 79. We gained federal recognition in 1981. So, uh, um, I mean, so the fight had been going on for, you know, well, 50 years. 50 years. Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course, with federal recognition, it doesn't mean that overnight the community is going to change. It, it makes the, the community eligible for certain grants, you know, um, HUD grants. Uh, you know, they were able to build some housing, and uh, and then 
of course, our tribe was fortunate to uh, get into the gaming industry uh, back in the uh, early 90s, and uh, that's really helped us a lot and brought opportunities, uh, created ways for people to come back home. Um, um, it was a way for me to come back home eventually, so. Okay, and so uh, now I want to switch gears a little bit, but it deals both with the 18th century and with federal recognition, and let's talk about the Tunica treasure. So can you tell us what this is and the history behind it and kind of what's going on today with it now at your wonderful facilities? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, I mentioned, you know, the Natchez massacre, you know, and uh, the, uh, and um, this, Side where the village was was somewhere close to uh, where Angola prison is. There was a um, prison guard there who was an amateur pot hunter, archaeologist, whatever you want to call it, um, and he looked at old maps and poked around and found a burial ground, and he digs up over two and a half tons of of burial goods, and a lot of it being European trade goods. I mean, tons of stuff, and uh, you know, everything from you know French and German ceramics, uh, tons of glass beads, uh, you know, iron tools, uh, muskets, you know, anything you can think of. Uh, uh, there's like bells and crucifixes and you know and there are some some indigenous pottery some of its tunica some of its caddo some of its natchez um, and just like the the egyptians we were buried with our earthly wealth our goods and so he dug up all the stuff and desecrated the graves you know i think he threw some of the bones in the river um, and um, he was looking for someone to buy it. He happened to know a guy named Stu Neitzel, who was uh, an archaeologist and working in the Wolves Parish. Uh, I think he actually opened the uh, museum at the Marksville Mound site. And uh, um, Stu Neitzel introduced him to Jeffrey Brain with the Peabody Museum. Jeffrey Brain was working on a big project, Lower Mississippi Valley, and was knew a lot about the Tunica, the Tunica sites. And uh, so he was able to, I don't know, it was some transaction where they, he allowed them to borrow the site to kind of do an assessment. I don't know if he charged them anything for it, but they, they um, Jeffrey Brain and his staff, they did an uh, assessment and evaluation of the whole collection. And Jeffrey Brain published a couple of volumes talking about the, the Ogden scenario. And, and what's significant about the Tunica treasure is it shows how important the Tunica were, the Tunica were in the trade of the 18th century. I mean, just the vastness. It's probably the largest collection of uh, European trade goods from the 18th century found in North America. So it's very significant. And and just just the sheer volume of it. And, uh, and um, it's funny, you know, so that, this prison guard dug this up in the late 60s and he was trying to find a buyer and and uh, he realized, well, the Peabody didn't want to buy it because they realized that he didn't have rights to the materials because he had gone on someone's private property and they call it the Trudeau site, I think it was a school plantation site. And so he sued the owner of the property, the property owner still sued him and it kind of, you know, wonder it was in the courts for a while, and then the state of Louisiana uh, gained ownership of the property, and they so they sued him, and and then, uh, but the Tunica Biloxi, we didn't really know about it at first, so we, we kind of held back because we were in the battle for federal acknowledgement, and we didn't want to put too many irons in the fire, so, um, but once we got federal recognition, the state supported our right to be a, primary plaintiff, or is that how you say it now? And so, um, so in a state court, we were uh, repatriated, they call it the Tunica treasure, it's just great goods, but 
they gave it back to us. And uh, this state case was a precedent for the federal law and act from the Native American Graves Protection Act. And so uh, we're very proud of that. Um, and uh, uh, in fact, um, when I moved to New Orleans back in uh, early 87, I was an intern at an archaeological firm that did the inventory of the collection. So I sat in a little tiny room over there in the old U.S. Mint, and I had my view of charters <laughs> at uh, Art Decatur. Yeah. Uh -huh. Anyways, and uh, you know you have all these. You know, I remember the beads. You know, you have to weigh them. There were some of them that were very small seed beads, but uh, labeling everything. And so I was, and I was sort of an intern working on that project. A cousin of mine showed up a month later, and so we did as much as we could. That, and then right after that is when I came to work here. So yeah, uh, <laughs> I was in New Orleans. And so, but uh, yeah. that's the story of the Tunica treasure. And uh, it's something that uh, we have a lot of pride in uh, because it really just, it connects us from the, from the present to the distant past, you know? And, and it represents how important the Tunica people were and this whole, Louisiana. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. um, I love the fact that you worked on it back then and now you're working at the facility that houses it today, which is a beautiful museum in Marksville. If you are in that area, you definitely have to stop by. The museum is wonderful and you can see some of the Tunica treasure on display. Um, as a museum professional, I have to ask you, um, you know, we're not supposed to talk about our favorite objects here because they're all our favorite. Um, <laughs> but there's always objects that speak to you on a personal level um, and have some kind of connection for you. Is there anything in this, uh, in these burial goods and the Tunica treasure that you, that really speaks to you or that you are, um, yeah? Well, uh, you know, I mentioned that there is some, um, indigenous pottery in, in, the, in the collection. And it's, you know, I said there's a, a Caddo and Natchez and Tunica. And to me, uh, I just, of course I like it because it was made by my people, but uh, it was, but it, 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 it kind of shows that there's this big trade network going on, you know, in that period. And, uh, you know, it represents to me our, heritage or, uh, as uh, entrepreneurs and we still are entrepreneurs today you know with our big casino resort and, and other ventures that we have the tribe has but to me it's representative of, of that heritage yeah yeah Oh, that's wonderful. Um, so let's go back to the Tunica language program because I find it's just a remarkable project that y'all are working on. So tell us about the efforts to revitalize the language and the culture and the program that y'all have doing and how, how that works. Mm -hmm. You know, I mentioned our relationship with Tulane and, uh, and the materials that we're developing. Uh, in 2014, I, I, I was uh, approached by my cousin who was on the council and she said, John, you know, are you tired of working in the casino business? And I said, yeah. yeah. And she said, uh, she goes, well, how would you like to, to head up uh, our language and culture program? And I said, that sounds great. So I helped her write a proposal. We submitted it to the council and it was approved. So in, on April Fool's Day in 19, uh, 2014, I, would, I came on board and started putting things together. My cousins, um, Elizabeth Reed and her mother Donna, who their fam family had sort of kept the language alive. Uh, the, their intermediate level speakers, there's no fluent speakers. So they are, uh, they work weekly with Tulane, you know, through Google Chats and developing these materials. So they take a lot of that heady stuff and they, they, they boil it down into something that can be used as lesson plans for, you know, for our, to teach our children. So we're teaching Tunica to our children as a second language. But of course, a lot of you may understand this, but a lot of, uh, of a community's culture is in the language. And when something like that, we, we like to say that it was slumbering. It wasn't extinct, it was slumbering. It was always there, it was always within us. 
and, and, and those who kept trying to keep the light with them community. So we're bringing this back. I mean, I'm very proud of this program because you know we're teaching, uh, we're doing after school classes for our children. Uh, we do a, a WebEx uh, seminar. We do like a six week run a couple times a year for the adults. In the summer, we'll have a five day camp. And you know, it's not only just teaching the language, but it's connecting it with the culture. You know, you want to make it um, relevant to the children. So, uh, language is alive, and so where could we create new words? You know, uh, um, you know, for modern things, and by using old words, putting them together. The linguists call that neologisms. And so, so we try to make it relevant. And everything we do, it might be a stickball clinic, it might be a basketry workshop, or a craft session, uh, uh, or powwow. We try to connect it to the language. And so, uh, um, of course, my daughter, who's she's a senior this year and graduated from high school, I've had her involved, of course, from the very beginning. And she's really learned a lot, and she's able to say short phrases and know vocabulary, and she's learning about her heritage, she's learning about where she came from, and that, that's the most rewarding thing. Even the adults, you know, which they're harder one, uh, uh, my elders support us, and they still have some memory of this, but uh, uh, they, they may, may know a few words, but they don't, you know, everyone spoke French. It was, you know, that's, that was the dominant language where we lived. So having this program, being able to teach the language, to do traditional cultural workshops, and uh, it, it's really sort of, uh, I don't know, it's, you know, it, it, we know it, it's helped with our identity. We know who we are. You know, if we didn't do this, we would be like any other person in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in Louisiana have some native heritage. They might not know it, but they do. Uh, but those who do, are part of our community, they know more about their history, their language, their culture, and that's very important. Um, well, is there, I think we've covered a lot of ground, about 300 years tonight. 500. 500, that's yeah. right. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add before we open it up to questions from the audience? Um, I, I joke around uh, with some friends of mine, I tell them that I'm a professional Indian. <laughs> and it's true, I am. Uh, uh, and, but I have a lot of pride in our community, and to, to see that within our, among our children, as I was just saying, and they can you know, tap their yeah. chest and say, that's, that's who I am, I'm Tuna Bobaluxi, you know, and, uh, but uh, um, to be able to talk about it, you know, I was, Talking, saying to you earlier when I worked here at the Hidden Historic Moms Collection, and uh, I saw how history was put together. And I worked in the manuscripts division, and um, in fact, the passage I read earlier the, the, that came from a manuscript that's here. Oh, wonderful, yeah. yeah. Kalu, uh, oh, the Kaya manuscript? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, and so, and it was in the, during that time that, you know, I, I was going to UNO and learn how history is written, you know, put together. And to be able to come back here, I, it was my desire to come back here eventually and to be able to talk about the Tuna of Biloxi and how the role they played in the, the development of this, of Louisiana and the greater colony or whatever. And uh, so I, I'm just say I'm very grateful that the, you know, you've asked me here tonight and, and I'm, I'm grateful to the Historic Lawrence Collection for the, the training that I got early on. Uh, so, uh, so um, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, and we're so grateful for you to coming for coming down here and being part of, you know, um, our tricentennial celebrations and the Founding Era exhibition and, um, you know, talking with us tonight uh, about the Tunica Biloxi. Um, and I guess at this point we can open it up for questions. I see a question right here from Alan. Um, two, actually. Oh. The, um, you mentioned the burial site, uh, Tunica, or Biloxi Tunica burial sites are 
traditional mounds? Or yeah, the tunica, well, the tunica were mound builders, but by the time they got to Wells Parish, uh, uh, the mounds that are there were, were built uh, much earlier. Uh, so uh, our mound building was, took place probably, I would say probably in the 16th century before. Uh, so yes, yeah, yeah, so uh, there is a story though um, that uh, the mounds at Marksville, our people's, um, uh, there was a, a WPA archeological dig that was going on there um, back in the 30s. And some of my great grandfather, Eli, and some tribal men went out there and they stopped them from digging. And they, they said, you're digging up graves. And they talked about it for a long time and they, the, the archeologists, archeologists convinced them that this was a, an ancient, Group and they were they were trying to be respectful, but uh, they didn't, you know. So, uh, but our people had some burials in that area. We saw it as a sacred place, and um, and so that was sort of some early activism by our people, and uh, you know, um, um, so you know, it's you know, I mentioned that a symposium I spoke at it earlier uh, last month. And, uh, where you know it's all about consultation and doing it in the right way, in the respectful way. You know, I'm, we all are for science, but you know, uh, I know when my uncle was uh, at, at the uh, hearing on the Tunica treasure. You know, he uses this. You know, how would you feel about someone coming into your community, and going into your cemetery, and digging up your relatives? Sure. Yeah. Okay. It's the other question I had. You mentioned uh, the horse trading things like that. Uh, what about the Catahoula Kerr as a dog? Did the Tunica have any? Mm, I, I really don't know much about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Laura. Um, so you mentioned language is a part, part of culture. Um, are there other aspects such as baskets or ceramics um, that maybe are a bridge between the past and the present or even just encouraging artistic um, endeavors among the members of, of the tribe. Yes, there's still uh, basketry, especially. Um, you know, um, I I know I talked about that earlier, but um, uh, Tunica Biloxi uh, did uh, cane uh, river cane basketry um, uh, in the early 20th century and before. Uh, and you know, of course, basketry is just, was mainly utilitarian. But as you got into the 20th century, uh, we we sold the baskets. And my relatives sold baskets to make money. Uh, I guess sometime around mid-century, uh, it was harder for the elders to get the river cane, so they uh, they learned how to make pine needle baskets. And they learned it from the from the Kisha, uh, uh, and uh, of course we improved on that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, but there's a lot, you know, a lot of the indigenous people that live in the region and use materials that are uh, that are available to them. You know, in the south, it's more of palmetto and the homas and chinmacha. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, they they do they do split cane there too. But uh, so uh, so we have had smaller uh, like weekly crafts where we'll do a series of uh, basketry and you know we, we've done it on our own but a couple of years ago uh, I was approached by a Homa elder and she said you know that a long time ago uh, Northwestern did a, a basketry summit you ought to do that well some time went by and and I decided to put one on so we we call we call it the basketry, basketry summit it's intertribal we invite regional tribes we have uh, we had some Porch Creek, we had Homa, Shirimacha, Alabama Kashada, Kashada. You know, we had about 70 weavers there last time, you know, and some of them are our, our, our community as well. But some of the young people show up and, and some families that are interested. So it, it's sort of like trying to get them in, interested in it again, and so it's more widely done, of course. Um, so, yeah, so basketry. We've also uh, have done, a, last couple of years, we've done a, a stickball clinic. Um, in Tunica, stickball is Puna Tarapani. Puna is ball, and Tarapani is the rackets. 
southeastern spitball. And so uh, while there's no one who really plays it anymore, I mean, my grandparents' the generation, there's pictures of people playing stickball, but it just faded. And uh, so I have friends with the Alabama Cachada tribe, and they have a stickball team. So I invite them over, they bring in a group, and we, we, they teach you the basic skills, and we'll do scrimmages, we'll divide the little kids with the older kids. Uh, it's co-ed. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, it's kind of a rough game, you know, it's a lot of, you know, <laughs> jockeying for a position and bumping and grinding and all that. And, and uh, you can't, of course, you can't tackle the women, the women can tackle the men. Uh, uh, and the women can also touch the ball, but the men can't. But no, th those are two examples uh, of, of traditional culture, and once again, we always try to tie the language in with the, the, with the whatever the sport or the, or the craft or whatever. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Okay. How many people do you have in your community now? And uh, you talked about some having moved to Texas. Uh, are you in touch with those people too? Or? Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, there's uh, about 1,200 uh, citizens on our tribal roll. Uh, that doesn't include spouses, uh, but uh, are on our tribal roll. Probably a little less than half live within about 50 to 75 miles of the reservation. Um, there's a the next larger group lives in southeast Texas, Houston, and Walmart area. And then there's a small contingent up in around Chicago. And so we all keep in touch. We have when we have tribal elections, which we just had one April first, coincidentally. And uh, they vote absentee ballot. Some of them are able to come down to the reservation and visit. Uh, powwow time. Powwow is coming up. Our annual powwow, which is uh, um, a, a May nineteenth and twentieth. You're all invited to come. Uh, and that that's. Uh, you know, whenever I I was a, I put together the committee that started the powwow, as you mentioned in '95. At first, it was kind of, some of the people in our community were kind of you know I don't know is that somebody I heard somebody said who was connected with our community but was not a tribal member said uh, that's not true. <laughs> well, uh, I beg to disagree because uh, you know we we met with other, you know, we had gathered with other uh, tribes. Uh, we sang, we ate, we played stickball, uh, danced, um, sang. We didn't call it powwow, but that's what it was. And that's what powwow is. Powwow is sort of a 20th century thing, you know, and you have them all over the country. We have uh, probably over 200 dancers that register uh, we do a contest. It makes it easier for a lot of the Indian people to travel. You know, they can get some prize money. We have singing contests of the traditional drums. So, so that has become sort of a family reunion for our community. And so, a lot of the tribal members that live up in Chicago and in Texas, they all, a lot of them, come in for that weekend. So, uh, it's I'd like it's our 23rd coming up. So, uh, so it's. Um, but even as when I was a kid, I remember uh, we'd go visit relatives in Texas. It was either for a funeral or a wedding, you know. But uh, but it was my grandfather's brothers, you know, that lived there, and you know they had families. And in fact, the Barberies in Texas spell their name differently from the Barberies in Louisiana, is uh, I guess whoever wrote it down, you know. In fact, I have one. Uh, well, my was my dad's half brother. And he spelled his name a third way. And I asked his son, I said, well, I said, there's different spellings. He goes, yeah, he was just trying to hide from the bill collectors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. OK. OK. Yeah. Uh, was your tribe impacted by the Trail of Tears, or was that just Eastern uh, indigenous? We were, we were very small. So we kind of, kind of like I said, flew under the radar. Uh, uh, it was the larger tribes in the, in the east, you know, the Choctaw, <coughs> the Cherokee, and Chickasaw. Did I say that already? 
Yeah, so those bigger tribes, and of course, as they went across, you know, there's people who dropped off. So you know, there's little bands of Cherokee and Choctaw that are all through the southeast before they even got to Oklahoma. But we were too small for the for the government to worry with us. Uh, there's a lot of smaller tribes that are in Louisiana that were, you know, we were we didn't impact them. We we lived in peaceful coexistence <laughs> with, with the colonials. I think someone um, in the back and, oh, sorry. You uh -huh. said that the, um, the Natchez Tunica were an amalgamation of different tribes? Oh, the Tunica belongs to are, yeah. So uh, with that also, what other tribes were there? And that would include the Pascagoula Indians also? Uh, it's mainly Tunica, Biloxi, Ofo, and Choctaw. So the Pascagoula Indians were not included in the Biloxi? No, uh, we had, you know, we, we we lived near them at some point, but uh, not, I can't say that Pascagoula was part of our group. Um, there's a woman in the back. There's a woman in the back that's been holding her hand up for a while. Uh-huh. Um, yes, sir. Uh, my name is Denise Wampu, and um, my heritage, I'm black Creole. I'm descended from a French-Spanish, also African and Native Americans. And last month, there was a talk over here. Um, they talked about the Africans in colonial Louisiana during the French and Spanish times. and they see how the Native Americans helped the African slaves, and there were different tribes of African slaves and different tribes of Native Americans around the plantations where they lived, and they would run away to the swamp or a wooded area and they formed maroon bands. Is there any history of the Tunica Indians or the Tunica Molest Indians that they helped a lot of African slaves? So this is more like a personal question for you. Well, I have to say that, you know, you know, I mentioned earlier on that, you know, we probably had a lot of empathy for this, for African slaves because we were at, you know, a lot of our people were captured and made into slaves too, so there's probably that, but um, I don't know of anything specifically with our community uh, dealing with uh, our with slaves, but I know that in my grandfather's generation, there was a, uh, in fact, it was a cousin, um, who married an African-American woman, and uh, there's a large portion of our tribe that, that looks African, you know. Uh, um, there's three people on our council that look African. Uh, so they would be considered the black too, because like they have the black territory. Well, we don't make that designation. Okay. We're, we're Tunica Biloxi, and we okay. just happen to have some mixed uh, ancestry. Well, everyone is mixed around. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, so just don't even know it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want to go back to the question about the population. So when you got federal recognition, did your population increase after that or not? Uh, yeah, well, um, you know, we had to uh, submit a role. And uh, and then this is interesting, you talk about African-American. Uh, um, when we submitted the role, and I can't remember the exact number that were on the roll at the time, this is in 79, but there, there was some Tunica, some Tunica Bluxy families that were clearly African American heritage. And uh, my uncle, who was chief at that time, uh, our chairman, he uh, convinced that family to, to not be put on the roll prior to us filing our petition. Because we, we were afraid that if we had those people on the roll that it would hurt our chances to be recognized. So uh, he, he, he made it, he gave him his word that after we achieved federal acknowledgement that he, that they would be on the rolls and he was good for his word, they were added to the rolls. So, uh, um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, it did grow and especially after we, we opened the casino. <laughs> Uh, eventually, the, the, yeah. 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 time for one more question. Okay, well, time for one more question. Way in the back. I'm Are you? This is off the subject. Do you have any comments about the World Heritage Site at Poverty Point? Oh well, you know, I just happened to be on the uh, commission, the Ancient Mounds Commission. They re-resurrected it right after Poverty Point was made a World Heritage Site, and uh, I've been there a couple of times, and. Um, yeah, that's an ancient civilization. There's really, uh, they're, they can't really connect it to any modern group today. But when I've gone there, you know, and I, you know, I took the tour and, and you know, I don't know, I, I, this is hard to explain, but you know, uh, you, there's this feeling you get that there's something bigger than yourself 
you know, that, that exists there. Uh, uh, of course, I get the same feeling when I go to the Marshall Mountains. So, you know, the, the ancient people, uh, there's a connection. And it's really kind of hard to explain. You just kind of feel it. And, you know, it might be passing, but it's something that's real. And um, um, actually, I've been asked to kind of help with some ideas about bringing some cultural programming there. They want, they want to do some kind of Native American uh, event there. So, um, but yes, uh, it, it's, um, I'm glad that they got that designation. The state is, you know, it doesn't have a lot of resources right now, but uh, it's something that uh, they should support. They should support all the mountain sites, all the parks up and down the river. Uh, but this is part of who we are here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much.